Welcome to The Bid, where we break down what's happening in the markets and explore the forces changing the economy and finance. I'm Oscar Polito. Latin America is a region at the cusp of a transformative era. As a region, it's become a hotbed of discussion for investors worldwide as it undergoes a remarkable convergence of forces, from a new era of high rates and macro risk to the rise of nearshoring in Mexico and the demographic changes shaping retirement. Today, I'm speaking with Axel Christensen, Chief Investment Strategist for Latin America for the BlackRock Investment Institute. Axel will help us explore how the tectonic shifts in demographics and the strategic embrace of infrastructure spending are creating a mosaic of investment opportunities and what makes Latin America an epicenter of global change. Axel, thank you so much for joining us on The Bid. Oscar, thank you for having me. So, Axel, you're the chief investment strategist for uh, Latin America for the BlackRock Investment Institute. You spend a lot of your time in Latin America, and it's a region that we haven't talked a lot about on uh, the bid. So I'm excited to understand a bit more about the investment opportunities and perhaps just a broad question to start, which is what are some of the headlines that are shaping the investment landscape in Latin America? Well, Latin America... First of all, it's a region, several countries, um, a lot of similarities like, uh, you know, common language, some cultural heritage, but a lot of differences as well. So some of the headlines that you probably see regarding Latin America recently have to do with elections, have to do with um, how Latin America is finding opportunity in some of the mega forces. We can talk about that, um, that are going out throughout the world. Um, how Latin America um, is um, becoming a very um, interesting uh, st- uh, place strategically uh, f- for, um, you know, geopolitical powers like the U.S. and China. So um, a-, a lot of interest recently uh, beyond, you know, the usual headlines around perhaps sports or food. Right. And uh, you mentioned it's a big region. It's diverse. Um, there's a lot of different countries. So let's talk about the mega forces. We've talked about the mega forces with respect to a number of different regions around the world. And uh, as a reminder, these are things like uh, the transition to a low carbon economy, diverging demographics, the future of finance. How are these mega forces impacting the landscape in Latin America? Well, it's a great question, Oscar. If anything, they um, put Latin America at the forefront. Let me give you a couple of examples. So one of the mega forces has to do with uh, geopolitical fragmentation. So the fact that um, after COVID that we saw that we had a lot of dependency in certain supply chains or, or you know, responding to an increase in tensions between the trade of, uh, of the U.S. and China, um, Latin America and some specific countries like Mexico are standing out as alternatives um, to provide more security in that supply um, uh, chain. So um, there's a lot of discussion about how um, Mexico can attract capital um, in key type of industries, uh, of course, some that already exist, like uh, car manufacturing, but also some new industries, like even semiconductors, which usually has been you know, something going on in Asia, not so much in Latin America. So, you know, nearshoring, friendshoring, geopolitical fragmentation, that megaforce, very, very involved in Latin America. Let me mention another one. Um, actually, two uh, for the price of one, Oscar. So um, South America is uh, the place in the world that has the largest reserves of critical resources that we need for two things. One, to allow us to transition into a lower carbon emission global economy. So if the world is serious and trying to you know, meet those objectives in, what is it, 2050, um, there's going to be a tremendous demand for resources like copper, lithium, and other minerals that are abundant in places like Chile and Peru um, and and somewhat in Brazil as well. So a lot of demand is going to, you know, increase investment in in, in that. It's going to provide governments with more uh, financial resources to do more. So, but it's not just the um, you know the climate change, but also think about AI and how AI is demanding a lot more um, electricity to have all these you know super uh, chips uh, functioning. And guess what? Um, copper again, lithium are very much connected to uh, pick up in electricity demand as well. So Latin America, focal point of a lot of these mega forces, Oscar. 
And you mentioned the electricity demand from AI. We had Will Sue from our fundamental equities uh, business recently, and he, he talked exactly on that point. He used terminology in terms of quantities that I had never heard before just to really kind of bring home the fact that there is a lot of electricity demand that is going to be required. And you're saying in Latin America and in South America in particular is where these, these resources exist that will help with that um, supply of electricity. We had Larry Fink also here uh, not so long ago, and he was talking about his annual letter. One of the themes that he talks about in there is infrastructure uh, and the need for more infrastructure development and spending around the world. So how does that impact Latin America's economic growth? That's a great question, Oscar. And, and actually, it links very much into um, our, um, the, the, what we were discussing uh, just a minute ago. All these opportunities I mentioned, nearshoring in Mexico and Central America, uh, the demand for these critical resources in South America will require investment. Take, you know, all this investment in new production, especially in the northern part of Mexico. You need more electricity. That means more investment in, say, renewable uh, energy uh, generation uh, in Mexico. Um, Mexico will require uh, more um, supply of water uh, to uh, be able to, um, you know, carry out a lot of these investments. A lot of them are very uh, intense in water use. We go to South America, you know, uh, all these mining projects to get the copper, to get lithium, they don't show up, you know, overnight. You have to go through investments, not only in the operation in itself, but also affecting the communities that, you know, are around these projects as well to provide them with housing with, again, water supply, um, education, you know, then you have to take the, these things that tend to be up in the mountain to ports. So you need ports and, and roadways. So, you know, to get these mega forests to become just a dream into real opportunities, infrastructure is going to be the key word there. And so Larry is spot on, and, and uh, hopefully Latin America will be a very good example of how that infrastructure will uh, help these mega forces uh, take place. Right. And infrastructure being a global need is what Larry's talked about. And you've specified how it could benefit uh, the Latin America region. You've mentioned Mexico a few times. I know you spend a lot of time there understanding what's going on on the ground uh, in the economy. You've talked about nearshoring. So uh, maybe just say a little bit more about that. How does this trend towards nearshoring really like impact the workforce in Mexico? Mexico is in a unique position. Not only is it, you know, the southern neighbor of the U.S., but it has been going through several decades now a very, very close integration. If you look at car manufacturing, actually, you know, cars go back and forth uh, the border between the U.S. and Mexico many times. Um, as they're being built and, um, you know, finally make it to the U.S. to be sold to uh, U.S. consumers. Um, so there's already a very strong basis of, you know, manufacturing and integration, logistics. The challenge and I guess the great opportunity for Mexico to scale up, to, you know, uh, go to more sophisticated, value-added, not just in cars, which, by the way, is very tech now. It's not you know, uh, cars, how uh, they used to be. There's a lot of technology in car manufacturing today. But the opportunity is to scale that up and, and to have Mexico be a very good alternative to some of the Asian economies that produce, you know, semiconductors, chips themselves uh, to provide, for instance, for uh, data centers as well. Um, so that full integration with the U.S., um, you know, building on what already exists, um, not only because of the uh, near um, uh, location that it has, but also Mexico benefits from um, you know a favorable trade situation with the U.S. and, and Canada for that for that matter as well. Um, no other country has that. Let me give you another example: electric vehicles built in Mexico are you know covered by the same credit regulation here in the U.S. Um, provides consumers. Um, Electric vehicles built in Korea or in Germany don't have that. So Mexico has really a very good opportunity to take this advantage and, you know, make this dream become a real opportunity, Oscar. And as part of scaling up their manufacturing, you mentioned technology, the role of technology. And I think earlier you talked about semiconductors and how that's 
typically been something produced maybe in other parts of the world, and you're seeing some of that production in, in Latin America as well. So it feels like maybe there's a move up the, the value chain exactly. that, that you're seeing across the region. Um, we've talked about demographics uh, globally and how some parts of the world are aging, some parts of the world, uh, perhaps that's not as pervasive. Where does Mexico fit in that continuum? What are you seeing about demographics in Mexico, and how is that shaping the retirement discussion in a country like Mexico? Well, Mexico is probably closer to the younger population group of countries, which a majority of emerging economies are. But, you know, things will evolve for it to, um, you know, be closer to perhaps where the U.S. is or uh, more developed countries. So um, it has the benefit of what we call the demographic dividend. That means as younger population, you know, um, goes to the school and makes it to the workforce, that really bumps up the economic growth. So um, there's a potential uh, for further growth in Mexico just because of this, um, you know, demographic change. But at the same time, it's already something that Mexicans are talking about looking at how can we shape, you know, our economy, our financial markets to take care of uh, retirement going forward. And, you know, as we learned looking at other countries, having the working population taking care of retired people is not enough. We need to be able to develop, you know, markets and alternatives to allow for people to save, to invest, and to help them, you know, face retirement um, with, you know, dignity, with a clarity on, you know, their um, financial wellness once they've, uh, you know, decided to uh, stop working. And I know I asked you the question specific to Mexico, but as you make your way around the region, is the the importance of that retirement discussion something that you hear in, in other countries in Latin America? Definitely. There's a lot of focus in uh, uh, several of these countries on looking at pension systems, seeing what's work, seeing what has to change, reviewing some of, you know, uh, of the parameters. Uh, are people saving enough? Uh, are people retiring at the right age? We're living longer. Does it make sense to still retire at the same age that perhaps our grandparents were retiring? Um, how can we also develop working opportunities for people that decide to um, work longer and, and perhaps, um, you know, uh, retire a little bit later uh, over life? So a lot of questions around that. Not a lot of easy questions because there's a lot of, you know, uh, kind of demands in the short term. But this is a discussion, Oscar, is very important to uh, set your eyes on the long term because, um, you know, you want to be taking the right decisions today. So not just us, um, but our, you know, our uh, children or eventually our grandchildren also are able to have a great uh, retirement as well. So let's uh, bring it to sort of a portfolio. Uh, I'm an investor, I'm interested in Latin America, and, and maybe focus on Mexico maybe as a starting point, uh, given some of the positive trends that you've highlighted. How, do you, how does an investor, how should they think about an, uh, an investment in Mexico and their portfolio? How do you think about the, the context of everything else that they're investing in? Right. Let me stop right Mexico, but I think I, I, I want to cover all Latin Americas because I want to take advantage of some of the diversity in industries and, 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 and opportunities that we can see in their whole, whole region. So um, we touched upon Mexico, right? So Mexico, of course, we want to be looking at the near-sharing opportunities. There are industrial companies that already are part of the manufacturing supply chain with the U.S. That's a very great starting point. We talked about infrastructure, companies that will be providing electricity, the roads, um, you know, the, um, the, the, the houses that uh, this new investment will, will provide as well. But why stay at Mexico? Let's continue down towards South America. We have Brazil, for instance. It's uh, beyond some of these critical resources on the mining. It's a huge market. So, you know, looking at how their population, their middle class has been growing, how that middle class is demanding, you know, more services, financial services, you know, housing, uh, home improvements, that in itself is a, is a great um, investment opportunity. And then Brazil also stands out to be one of the major food producers in the world. So to the extent that, you know, uh, geopolitical fragmentation not only has to do with manufacturing supply chain, it also has to do with securing, you know, food. 
uh, to your people. So Brazil is really, you know, the leveraging on that opportunity. And then you have places like um, Chile, like Peru, uh, we mentioned in terms of their opportunity uh, regarding um, the demands of critical resources. Um, and then let me, you know, cover the whole regions. There's a very, very interesting number of uh, companies that are starting uh, in Latin America. They are very, very digital. They are very, very, you know, technology-based, be it, you know, um, digital banks. It might be payment systems. It might be delivery systems. Um, what's interesting is they're developing and deciding to, you know, list themselves uh, as, as, as companies directly in the U.S. Uh, they're seeking specialized investors. So when we invest in Latin America, don't just keep yourself to the region. You can find plenty of very interesting Latin American plays uh, listed here in the U.S. as well. Right. So it sounds like there's uh, some critical natural resources that exist in the region, but there's also a lot of innovation going on uh, in the region. So, Axel, any final takeaways for uh, investors when they think about the Latin America region? Well, first of all, it's, you know, a great uh, area of opportunity. Um, we talked about how megaforces touch in, in several aspects of uh, the region. Um, I also want to, um, you know, uh, highlight the diversity of opportunities. It's not just Mexico. It's not just Brazil. Uh, it's also other countries that provide in each uh, of their own, you know, uh, different uh, industries, different type of companies that, you know, are really, really excellent at what they do. And then just the region itself and what it's also providing to the rest of the world, some very, very interesting startups. And not just startups, they're becoming real companies nowadays. And sometimes that innovation is making its way to the U.S. in terms of a, of a U.S. listing. Axel, I mentioned we, we haven't talked a lot about Latin America uh, in uh, on the podcast, so I appreciate you uh, making the trip to New York and giving us a little bit of a tour of the region. Uh, this summer, for those who want to uh, learn a little bit more about Latin America, we have the Copa America uh, soccer tournament, which will start uh, in June, which is not just Latin America countries, but it's primarily Latin America countries. So who's who's your country? Who are you rooting for? My country is my home country, Oscar. I'm, I'm originally from Chile. Um, Chile will be playing uh, a difficult group, including world champion Argentina, um, very close by. Uh, uh, I think uh, at the MetLife Stadium around here in, in the coming days. So um, I'm rooting for Chile. Uh, Chile has been going through a, a bit of a, a, a you know, a, a bump in terms of their great performance uh, in some Copa Americas in the past. Well, they were the 2015 and 2016 champions, if, if I remember. So good luck to Chile. Thank you for joining us on The Bid, Axel. Thank you for having me, Oscar. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Bid. If you've enjoyed this episode, check out Geopolitical Insights with Catherine Kress, where we discuss the structural shifts that are redefining global dynamics.